Okay. Hi. Okay, that was very inspiring. Good evening. Okay, let's continue the uh, the uh, the shear <coughs> from where we left off. I hope you have your sheets. Uh, I think they added another group of sheets. This over here. I don't know if you have it. I hope you have it. It's, it should be on the WhatsApp group. That we'll see what we can do. Anyway, we um, analyzed um, uh, last time the different psukim uh, dealing with Sipriyas uh, Mitzrayim, and we saw that the Tana the Mechilta. Rabbi Yishmo, when he um, when he, he he took these psukim and understood that they do not most mostly do not deal with Cypriot Testament Shrine. We can go through it once again very shortly. The Pasik of the Russia deals with why what's the value of uh, uh, of the Korban Pesach, which is asked on Yudal the Nisan. We then had the um, the uh, Tam. Which asks Mazois dealing with some day in the middle of the summer with Pidim Peta Hamor, Mazois. And then we had the Ben Achacham, which is asking, like, what is the what is the basis of our religious beliefs and our obligation to our Kaddish Baruch? And we saw that the Tana uh, decided to take all these uh, these people and transplant them to the night of the Seder, which is really an Abshuta Shemikra. I don't know if I mentioned it, it's Mufush and Chidush Ritva. I saw it afterwards also very clearly. Chidush really writes this, that the Pshuta Shemikra is talking about a child which had uh, left Egypt and had gone out of Egypt with everybody else. And that child has a different answer. The answer we're giving is already a beginner of Drush and not Pshat, dealing with a later child, a child which obviously, I would say, is dated to the times of Rabbi Shmuel, as we discussed at length. So we see clearly that the um, the Baal HaGod, what we call Baal HaGod, a real Shilta, or Bishmo, transplanted four types of Banim to tell us that there's going to be four types of Banim uh, at the Seder table. And they're all going to be asking questions about the Seder table. Puts new questions in their, ma in their mouths or takes the Psukim and changes its context, as we pointed out, which is question about religious quest, um, he suddenly translates it as uh, what are the laws of Pesach and of Kimino uh, And the answer there is, hello, teach him the shais of Masech Pesachim until the end of our Pesachim. We learned that last time, as opposed to the answer found in the Chumash, a totally different answer. It was very clear from uh, Rabbi Shmuel, he believed that the answers and the questions asked in uh, in the Pesukim themselves are not relevant to the night of Pesach. That seems to be very clear. Otherwise, how could he possibly add new ideas in their mouths? Why not transplant the total Parsha into the Haggadah and say this has to do with the night of Pesach? There is a Machlaikis in this, and this is where we left last time. If you have your pages, go to the uh, source page two, source Yud, where we saw that the Mirab Shimba Yuchoi, which is the Ktan Talmidov of Rabbi Akiva, you probably know this Rabbi Shmo was the counterpart of Rabbi Akiva. Rajbi was the was the youngest Nismach of Rabbi Akiva. Ramish the youngest. He was one of those few Talmidim that Rabbi Akiva uh, uh, re, 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 rebooted the development of Teresh Peh by basically all the, the other ones were dead and he started all over again. Just as a small aside, I don't know if you know this, but in the Ari, it's taki written that the Lam Yomtev of Lag Boim is not because it's a your site, because it's the beginning of uh, of, 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 of Rabbi Kiva teaching his Madura Basra, his remnants of Talmidim, and starting Torah all over again. The Ari actually writes this, you know, if we ever meet again around Lag Boim, show to you inside. He literally writes, this is not a Yom of Tira, this is a Yom of Simcha. But um, we won't go into that at the moment. Whatever it be, this is the Mechilta of Rajbi, the Mechilta of Abshur and Bayuchoy. And let's read this. So in Source Yud, quoting the Sefer Mitzvahs in Kufnun Zion, going down halfway down, literally one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven lines, uh, last two words of the text. Well, the Shon Mechilta de Rajbi Medrash Agadol, 
Michlau Shenemar Ki Yishalcha Bimcha, since the Pasik says Ki Yishalcha Bimcha, which is talking about the night of Pesach, that's the Pasik in Dvorim in Bamid in Shmois Yud Beis. Yachol Im Yishalcha Tamagidlo, one would have thought that only if he asked the question, then you will tell him, Vim La, but if he doesn't ask anything, and Tamagidlo, don't. <laughs> Don't bother. You can have a short supper and go to sleep. Okay, Yecho, we would have thought that the mitzvah is only vigata and nothing more. Tamud Lomar, vigata, so we say, Tamud Lomar, vigata lebincha. The Pasik says, vigata lebincha, apapiche, no shocha, period. Now let's look at those psukim. The first Pasik was ki yishalcha. We saw last time the Ki Yishal Chabim Cha is not a question about the night of Pesach. We saw last time the Ki Yishal Chabim Cha was a question of what is the, why are we religious? What is the basis of our observance? Why do we even, why are we in this? Why do we feel obliged to listen to the word of God? That was the question. And there was a lengthy answer there describing how we re-encountered God in Egypt and thus we feel obliged. For whatever it be, we will uh, probably have to explain it again today. What does this have to do with Pesach? Is the night of Pesach a, quest, a, a night of religious quest? Is that the question we're expecting from the Ben HaChacham? It's not what Michal to Rabbi Shmuel says. And yet he feels that Rajbi feels he has Pshuta Shemikra we would have thought that that same question only happens if the child asks. And if he doesn't ask, we don't answer those, that we don't bring up those type of questions. It's a nice way of saying, we would have thought teaching theology, we don't bring up questions of theology to the youth. We wait for them to grow up and ask. It is only that child which we, 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 we if he asks, we will answer. Yacho, we would have thought that no, maybe I'm, we don't rock the boat. It's a common practice in many uh, educational institutions that instead of uh, teaching the foundations of faith, we believe in what we call a muna peshuta, and therefore let the child be. Well, then here this is a mamash to the Rajbi. We would have thought that only if the child is inquisitive enough to ask these questions, that's when we will relate to it. We only react to a question, but we don't initiate the dialogue of religious quest of why are we religious and the Talmud Leimer seems to be saying and the Talmud Leimer is and how do we know that even if he doesn't ask it's not that way Talmud Leimer we got the Lebincha Afa Pishen Sholcha no in the Vigat Lebincha we see that we must deal with the basis of religion even without him asking well first of all there's something really very interesting here we clearly see here that the optimum way of dealing with a question in religion is first have is reaction to a question which is very logical now i'll explain it in two minutes you know when i was a very young man and Rav Hutner, Zichon Bracha, he gave me a lot of good advice about education and one of the things he told me whenever they ask you a question first check out whether it's a question or it's a challenge second of all never give them the answer until their tongues are dry and white they're dying to hear an answer. I said, why? Because if not, it'll just be a vort. And a vort will say it shall assure this. But it won't be something which will basically integrate into their psyche. They won't really live it. So you have to wait until they're dying from thirst for that answer. I actually, that, that is my educational policy. Me, yoy, mitchalt, yad, But um, this is what's happening. So obviously, it is, you know, there's so many great ideas which are waiting to be redeemed by a question. And until then, they're just words. It's only once you're in the darkness of, of a, uh, you're in the darkness of question, you really don't understand. And then when the idea comes out and suddenly redeems you from that darkness, that's when you have an answer. That's when you appreciate it. That's when you integrate it. That's when you understand it. That's when you, it, it, it touches you in every fiber possible. Well then, um, one must understand that we thought that the optimum way of dealing with religious quest is through question, which is probably true. But the Pasi teaches us that that's not enough. We can't always wait for questions. We must educate. Even that, that child which doesn't ask, 
we have to integrate, we have to discuss religion and the basis of our religion to the youth today on the night of Pesach. And that's exactly what this Bechilta de Rajvi teaches us. And first and foremost, of course, Der Shaila Vachuva is the optimal way of doing it. And the only source of having question answer a dialectic relationship on the night of Pesach is from that Pasik in good old Devarim dealing with religious quest. All the other psukim, if you recall, were not in the night of Pesach. Whether it was the question of why do we do mitzvahs of Bechaira, why do we do all the mitzvahs? Those are the only questions. The challenge of the Russia is not a question. And we clearly see the din of Der Shaila Vachuva on Leil Pesach, its source is those questions which are not talking about the night of Pesach. They're talking about Tamea Mitzvos. Why are we religious? Why, why, why is it important to us? Why is it a truth? The real questions are that we should be asking. And he actually says, yeah, that's the Makkah, the dinner of Der Shaila Vachuva on the night of Pesach. I want you to understand that. This alludes to one thing only. The das of the Mechilta de Rajbi, as opposed to the Mechilta de Rabbi Shmuel, is that the theme of the night of Pesach is not primarily the story of the Exodus and the stories of the terrible things that happened and how we were, we, we were extricated, literally drawn out of there. No, no, that's not the issue. The issue is the theological ramifications of it, our re-encounter with God, and thus describing why are we religious. This just seems to be clear as day as we see this in the Mechut of the Rajvi. It almost feels that during the, um, when we discuss the Agada, we should really be talking about what does it mean believing in God and why, and how the exodus of Egypt re reintroduced God to us, and what did we relearn from there? Those are totally different topics, the ones usually discussed at the Seder, Actually, I think, you know, you know, it's been many years in education. One has to start learning how to do that today with children of today. Yes, in this postmodern world, we have to go back to reintroduce values in a language which will make sense to these people. But we have to translate the Haggadah in a way which will talk to them too. For the platform of our religious beliefs is the epic of Egypt. And one has to try to understand this. This seems to be a major machlaik has been Rajbi and Rabbi Shmuel. What is the Allah? What do we do? So here's something interesting. I'm going to before I describe what 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 is the what is what what, what should we should be doing in that theme, I'd like to first see what is the Allah. So the Allah is very clear. Um in your source Yud Aleph, in your second page. You have the Allah of Rambam, and he reads as follows. Before I quote the Rambam, I'd like to quote the Gemara. The Gemara says, um, this, you, uh, you know, actually, now I see it's over here. It's in source Tet, but the first paragraph of, uh, of the page two on the, on, the, on the right side, it says over there in the fourth line, second, two, two last words of the line, Matchil b'knut umsayim b'shvach. The practice of the evening is we do what you call a juxtaposition. We start talking about the negative and we end with praise of the Lord of the good things that are happening. My big nut, what is the bad things we start with? Rav Amar, we start talking about mitchila of day of without gilulim Our forefathers, going all the way back to third generation of creation, Enosh, leading until Terach, where they were pagans. That's the, uh, that's the Gnus. Ushmul Amar, now we don't start, we don't talk about prehistoric history. We go directly to Avadim Hayinu, we describe what happened in Egypt. Now, if one looks carefully, one would think, and this is the way many people somehow understand, the question is, we all end in the same place. We talk about the Exodus. The question is, at what point do we start? Do we start how, how, murky we were and yet God took us out. That's Matzla Begnus. Or do we simply say, listen, we were in dire straits and God took us out. It would seem to be a quite one theme called Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. The only question is, where does the story start? Yet Rambam in his book codifies it totally different and sees it as two independent themes of which there's a primary and a secondary. 
So please read your Rambam again on page two, source Yud Aleph, Al Chadalid, which is the first paragraph on the left column. One must start with the negative and then with the praise of God for the good things. Ketzad, how does one do this? Matchil umisaper, you start by relating and saying, Shevetchilah you have obtained to be made terach umulfanav, our forefathers going all the way back to terach and even before him, which is really Enosh, the, the grandson of, uh, of Adam, which is the one that introduced paganism to the world. To e kofrim, they were they 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 were simply denied the existence or the uh, or the caring of this God Creator. Between achar hahevel, and they were misled following hevel. Now, just an understanding of the word. If you read your Ramban in his pirush of of uh, Kohelet on the pasuk havel havalim hakol hevel, he explains hevel means mist, like a fog. When uh, when you're in when you're in the midst of the fog, you feel it's very dense, and it's like so real that you really can't go through it. Yet as soon as a bit of the sun shines out, all those droplets evaporate, and it's really nothing. It has no consistency at all. He says to Hevel means things which look on the face of it they seem to look very dense and very real. It's only because we lack enlightenment. When our or hachachma comes out, when the truth shines, when people start thinking, for goodness sakes, well, then all of a sudden these temporal realities evaporate and become meaningless. So he says, to'in achar hevel, they are misled by falling after things which have no consistency. That would be the exact translation of hevel. They wrote fim achar vodazara, and they pursued vigorously after pagan deities. Um, I once gave a long explanation of why this happened. Don't think we're going to do it today. Um, uh, and you end the story. This is the narrative. But that I met, you ended the story. This is the first one. Mitril umisayein. You end the story. But that I met with the true religion. Actually, true is not accurate. One would say the absolute religion. Reference for that. Read Rambam. Perik al Yisraeli Atara Allah Beis. Emes means absolute. So the absolute uh, religion, I say absolute because sometimes true, there's more true, less true, and then you have what we would call relative truths. But when we talk about absoluteness, there is no relative absoluteness. So I'm going to say the word data emet means absolute religion. Shekhevanu hamakim lay that God had brought us close to him. Vivdilanu minatayim, he had set us aside from those who are misled. And he brought us to his total infinite oneness. That's the end of the story. According to um, the Rambam, Rav says that the narrative of the evening is the theological reality where we were deeply engaged in paganism. And finally, God took us out and reintroduced monotheism to our existence. Then he continues, V'chein, and also. Now, one who is used to learning Rambam knows when the Rambam says V'chein, and you say and also equals, it's the secondary. A, do this. Now, this is not the sequence. The Rambam himself writes in the sequence that the sequence starts with Avodim Ayinu before of Mitzrayim. You start with Avodim Ayinu. Yet, when he talks about the Machlegs of Rav and Shmuel, he first brings the din of Rav talking about what? And the answer is right. As far as what's important, is the primary goal, the primary discussion. The secondary is Avadim Hayinu, which we will explain shortly as to why. Obviously, for whatever reason, be which we will also have to explain. The sequence, the order of things that we first start with the story of Egypt, of what we know by Mitzrayim, and then we go to Mitzrayim, and then we go to Mitzrayim. This you can see in the Nusach um, HaGadah found in Source Yud Bet, where you can see it carefully that in the third paragraph, he starts with Avada Mayinu, and believe me, Mitzrayim comes a bit later. Okay, so um, this is the Vechain of this Halacha. Bechain and also equals a secondary priority. Matchil, you start um idea and you let know. Shavadim, you know the Pharaoh We were slaves in Egypt. 
Now, I just want to understand we go further. The idea of a slave. You know, we think constantly when we teach slavery, we think of terrible things. We have images of whippings. We think of Auschwitz. We think of forced labor camps, a plush of I don't know what. No, there is a value called freedom. Even a luxurious slavery is slavery. This is a Gemara. And the Gemara is actually found, you look carefully on the right column, the top paragraph, you go to the last four lines. Rav Nachman said to his slave, his Canaanite slave was called Doro. Avda, a master which frees his slave. The Yoyavli Kasiva even gives him silver and gold. My boy, what's he supposed to say to him? You're supposed to thank and praise. Well, if that's the case, we don't need the Manishtana anymore. We fulfilled our dialogue. The dialogue was what do we do when we're redeemed? We thank. We're not talking about an afflictive slave here. I'm sure that Dory, the evidence of Nachman, was not punished, it was not whipped. It would be Usher al Pidin. He lived a, whatever life of a slave is. Okay? And yet, that slavery and that freedom is what we're supposed to focus on. Equals the bottom basement of reality is, first and foremost, appreciate freedom. The idea of being what we call a Ben Chorin. No, most people don't know what that is. You know, you know, our images are always about terrible, atrocious things. No one thinks about the value of freedom. You know, I remember uh, telling my students, you know, I suggest you all read Alex Haley's novel called Roots. It's a book about a, uh, a man who uh, investigated the, uh, the, the, the Afro-American, investigated his familial roots to find out, like, from the first person, great, great, great grandfather, which was kidnapped in Ghana, bought in a slave ship, until whatever happened, you know what? Well, I read that book. Walked out with a serious appreciation of freedom versus slavery, the, 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 the wickedness of slavery, taking away, it can be even a, a luxurious slavery. We can be dressed in silks, but you're not your own person. The slave doesn't have his own decision process, his time is not his, his ear is not his, Nothing is his. Literally, la lacha, he is the imperson, he is the embodiment of the ego of the master and nothing more. The only one I'm a slave to, hopefully one day, will be God. To the extent that I have no ego, it will be oh, totally be only an expression of God's alter ego, that's what I will become is Evan. But that's what Abdus is, a very important theme which should not be skipped over on the night of Pesach. Before we talk about the terrible things, talk about the fact we were slaves. I don't mean servants. I don't mean employees. I mean slaves. So this is what he says. First, we was talk about Shavadima in the fire of Mitzrayim. That's number one. The Chola Ra'ashik Malan, and also it was a terrible slavery. That's how you start the second theme. Umasayim, and you end that second theme. But you see when float. And the wonders and the miracles we discussed last week, the differentiation between Nisim and Niflos, I will deal with it a little later. Shinasu Lanu, the things that happen. Here you underline the fact we it's not enough to say that we're in Nisim, we actually became free. It's not enough to say Pada Oisanu mi base avadim. That's what we all think about. And we think about we walked out of a terrible situation. No, no, no. You became Free, Cheru a very important theme which must be discussed. <coughs> Excuse me, the who, and how does one do this second theme? And first, so he says, You start the second theme by, by doing hermeneutics and drushes and elaborating. I'm from the Parsha of Arami of Edavi, Achi Kola Parsha, until you finish that Parsha, which is all of four or five sukkim. That's all they are. And you're Doresh, that parsha. Not enough to read it, you're Doresh, which means you try to see insights. The insight that Chazal bring. That's why we read that Medrash Halacha, and we read that Medrash Halacha, which describes the drushes, and we must understand those drushes. Anyone who adds or elaborates what? Bidrash, parsha, zu, 
in the drash of this specific parsha equals not simple words and discussions of who knows what. Specifically focusing on drash parsha zu areza meshuba. We find in the Rambam quite a few ideas which um, I think have to be be rejuvenated and brought back to the stage. A, as mentioned before, the idea of, of describing the meaning of slavery versus freedom. But today we call human rights that we take for granted, definitely was not taken for granted for centuries. The idea of slavery, and that can be in many ways. We have that today too. This is something we must discuss. That's number one. B, obviously we have to discuss, another thing came out is, there are two themes. There's one theme of dealing with the transition from paganism to um, monotheism. That's theme number one. Theme number two is what really happened in Egypt, how terrible it was, and the nisim and the flows which God, through which God took us out of there. Another idea is that the Kola Marble Asabi Bitsias and Sarah Reza Mishubach deals directly and solely with Marich Mosif Umarich Bidrash Parsha Zu of Arami Avidavi. It would seem to be why is it that this where's the source of the Rambam? And why is it that this idea of the transition from paganism to monotheism is so cardinal to the evening? It's very clear the source of this thinking is Mechilta de Rajbi. For Mechilta de Rajbi, the one that says that basically, yes, the issue of the evening is describing the basis of religion. And therefore, it is a topic, a, the major topic of the evening. And that's why there's a correlation to Zohar as Yom Asher Satamehat and Sraim, Vahayi Kishal Chabincha, and the Gata Labincha. That's the major issue of the evening. And then there's the issue of Mitzrayim, and now we have to find out what's the relation between them. But that's clear that what we hear, according to Rama, Rav is reflecting the Mechilta de Rajbi. Shmuel is reflecting the Mechilta de Rabbi Shmuel, Allah, and we pass in both. We clearly see that also in Sefer HaMitzvahs, that emerges, both things are quoted equally in the Sefer HaMitzvahs, for both are true. Therefore, we must understand that it's a heavy night. Let's try to understand what this is and why and what's important. Well, to understand the background of this idea that the major theme of the night of Pesach is, um, is the story of introducing ourselves back to monotheism, I'd like you to look at source um, number uh, Yud Gimel. It's a Rambam in the Alachas of Avodah Zora. Perik Aleph. And then if you flip the page to page four, you have a Lacha base. Halacha Aleph describes the basic background of why man moved away from monotheism to paganism. This is, a, I don't think that's the issue we're going to talk about tonight because that is a very important issue. We'll leave it if you don't mind. No, maybe it is important. Let me just give a basic, uh, some kind of a synoptic overview. It was very clear if you read the Bible that people did not think that these clay dolls were creators. And no one thought that the constellation Aries or Sun or Moon were creators of existence. They did not have, they did not think that the world always was. This is a, the idea of a world without a creator is something which is comparatively new. It only starts from the Greek era. This is brought up actually in Aristotle and Plato. They discussed the idea of a world which always was. But beforehand, um, man never dreamt of a world without a creator. It is only that they chose um, they realized that um, looking at the different constellations and understanding that these are the, those govern our lives, at least that's how they understood it, they perceived it like a king's court with noblemen. And they felt that these uh, noblemen, the sun, the moon, all the different uh, characters of nature, they're independent lords, which may say have been empowered by the great king of creators. They did not want a direct relationship with the king, and I can imagine no one would want to. Like, why would you want to have a direct relationship with the president of the company, which is up on the 80th floor, which only drinks single malts, plays golf, 
and you have to be dressed properly. And having your office next to his is very, very imposing, quite overwhelming. I would prefer to deal with my department head, which wears torn jeans, a t-shirt, gets drunk on Super Bowl Sunday, drinks beer and goes bowling. He's earthy. I don't have to be proper. Living with the boss is um, like living with a, um, with a, <laughs> with a sharp-eyed mother-in-law. What can I tell you? Not the easiest thing to do. Ultimately, this is not psychologically forced people to uh, look into the nobleman of the court and keep the king in the back burner, realizing I will honor the nobleman. Ultimately, through that, I am indirectly honoring the king. That is the basic movement of paganism. And this was unbelievable. People wanted to have a relationship with some celestial reality. They did not think they could work without a god, which is really interesting. This went on for thousands of years. Um, literally until the Hellenistic period. Uh, until the beginning of Bayez Shani, literally. That's at that point of time, man moved away from, from there to something else. Once again, this is not the topic of the evening, so I can't elaborate. But that's what happened. Man ran away from a, from the, a, a, a supreme, uh, omnipotent God, creator, because you felt small and you didn't want to feel small. It's like you want the rabbi, which will tell you things that make you comfortable. You know, you know the story about the rabbi, which, uh, which, uh, which comes and he says a speech on Kashrus and the sisterhood. President comes, rabbi, don't talk about that here. Then he talks about I don't know what Tyrus on Mishpacha, the brotherhood. President comes and says, listen, this is not a topic. Then he says, well, what about Shabbos? Do me a favor, rabbi. We have a tournament on Shabbos. So what can I talk about? It's very simple, rabbi. Just talk about Judaism. Now, give me the fluffy stuff, which will not be demanding, and I'll love you. Now, this is exactly what happens, basically, in history. Man ran away from an overwhelming God, which is demanding, to find a God, a nobleman, which won't be that demanding, and he'll be able just to be himself. This went on and on until finally the world was, was plunged. In, it started with the third generation of, of creation from Enosh. And they were plunged into paganism to the extent they became so decrepit and no morals that God had to put a flood out there. And then they started it all over again. And finally, there was only one person there which somehow realized, one person, all of humanity, that we must stop this and go back to a monotheistic God. That's Avram Avinu. Okay, he developed a crowd, he developed a family, and he actually developed a mini nation of teachers and followers until they came to Egypt. And then let's read Rambam. You have it at the end of Lachabet. It's in page four, your left column. You, you have the top paragraph, you go down halfway down. And he writes as follows. This idea of monotheism grew from strength to strength, Ibnei Yaakov and the children of Jacob, Uban Yilvim Aleyim, and those people that followed them, which the Rebbe before describes, Kip Umak Uma, they were like a nation, there were actually a, a lot of people doing this. V'nases ba'ulam Uma, and the world now had a nation, Chiyodat et Yudke Vavke, that it knows this Yudke Vavke, God of creation. Until there was a prolonged period of time the Jews were in Egypt. And they reverted back to learning the ways of the Egyptians. They assimilated into the, into, into the scene. They too reverted back to paganism. Except for Shevet Levi. You must understand, okay, in reality, I just want you to know, take the census of Shevet Levi and Parshu Bamidbar, and you realize it's 0.96% or something like that of the population. But that population was only 20% of the full nation of Judaism for only 20% left, 80% died in Makis Choshech. So do times five, you're going to get to something very minute. I think it's 0.007 or something like that percent of the total nation of total family of Yaakov. A 
small, minute percentage. A mere chain of nicker. That was Shevet Levi, and only Chutzmi Shevet Levi, Sha'amar and Mitzvah's Abbas, they stayed and continued this idea of monotheism. You're talking about the 99.3% of this nation reverted back to paganism. That was our situation. Ukimat Kat. It was a small split second. Now that's a language which reminds me of Cinderella, if I may say. It was two seconds before midnight and our chariots were going to become pumpkins and our horses were going to become mice. Kimat Kat, it was a small split second. Haya, Haikar, Sheshatal, Avraham Ne'ekar. That sapling, that, that, that principle that our forefather Avram had planted into the psyche of humanity was going to become totally uprooted. And the children of Jacob are totally going back to the mistake of the world. And they're, once again, the idea of they're living with a mistake. That was the situation in Egypt. It's so funny because we get all these different little pictures coming from our grandchildren, coming from kindergarten, some bald, skirted Egyptian flogging some Jew which has appeared, I don't know what, what are you talking about? The Jew and the Egyptian were both serfs. The Egyptian was a serf. Anybody who reads the end of Parshas um, uh, Vayichi and Vayigash, excuse me, Vayigash, knows that the person who created the feudal system is Yosef Atzadik. He's the first person which took all the lands of the nation and gave them to the crown, except for the, the, the lands of the church. And everybody became a serf, literally. The feudal system that we know, the idea of a king owning everything, you're nothing more than a sharecropper, if we may say, is the institution made by Yosef Atzadik. Read Chumash. I don't know why history doesn't like give him his credit. I'm not sure I want the credit, but that's what happened. Read it. They were all serfs. The typical Egyptian lived in his mud hut, entire poverty for goodness sakes. He wasn't living in luxury, and the Jews too. The Jews, and granted, in the end, were, were really slaves and bricklayers or whatever they were, okay? But at the end of the day, they were at the bottom of the social ladder of, of Egyptian society, but they were totally assimilated. There was no Taira to be had. All they had was Sheva Mitzvah's Bnei Nayach, which the Egyptians had too. And just as the Egyptians didn't keep them, they were over by the Zara and all these other terrible things. So were the Jews, remember, except for Shevet Levi. They were all pagans. There was really no difference between the typical Ben Yaakov and the local Ben Kush. They were all the same. They were friends. I would imagine that the Jews felt terrible when their friends couldn't have a shower for seven days because it was blood. They, I imagine multi Jews felt terrible that, the, uh, that my friend is inflicted with lice and boils. Why wouldn't you feel that way? Was every Egyptian neighbor a taskmaker, master, or were they neighbors? They played marbles together. We were basically totally assimilated culturally, religiously. The only thing we kept, and actually not all of us, only 20% of us, was some kind of ethnic identity, some tribal identity. We kept our language, which at least according to some Midrashim, which the Ramban already points out, it's a Canaanite dialect, not just the Jews. We kept our According to some midrashim, our mode of clothes, okay, so we enjoyed the night clothes. And what? It, they weren't strimals and, and vice zutten, you understand? This wasn't religion. They kept a certain ethnic identity. They had their Knanite, they were nobility in Knan, and they wanted to keep that. And they kept their names. Once again, they had a certain unique identity. That's about it. But you know what? And that was only 20% of them. 
80% of them were so assimilated, they didn't even keep that. Reminds me of the terrible situation we're in today in the Pew Report, which came out about a year ago. We have the overwhelming number of Jews in the United States which are not even affiliated with anything of Judaism, not the Federation, not the JNF, not in any type of synagogue, nothing. They are members of the global village and they don't see themselves as Jews in any fashion, form, or size. That was a situation for 80% of the Jews in Egypt. Very reminiscent of what's happening today. Pretty frightening. You know, I wish they would go to some kind of reformed temple or something like that. Just to keep a sense of identity. And that didn't happen. So that's what we were at. And I just want to show how far this goes. I want you to read with me Source Tetvav. Source Tetvav is a Perik in Yechezkel. Perik Chav. Where Yechezkel describes the situation of the Jews in Egypt and afterwards, adding many things that we don't know from the Chumash. But obviously the greatest inter interpreter of the Chumash is God himself through his prophets. Probably the most primary Mephorish of Chumash that I know. Uh, let's see what, Yech what God through Yechezkel describes. What was the story with the Jews in Egypt? So if you can go to page five, you have um, Perik Chaf. Let's just start, I'll skip Sukkim, by Hiba Shemash Vi'it in the seventh year of the Gullus of Ba'is Rishon, Bechamishi in the fifth, Ba'asor, Bechamishi in the fifth month, Ba'asor Lachodesh in the tenth day of that month, Ba'a Nashim Iziknei Yisrael, the Droshes Hashem, elders of the Israelites came to Yechezkel. To have a dialogue with God by Yeshua Fanai, they sat in front of me. And I'm going to skip a bit. I just want to show this to you. And the Pasik says in Pasik, hey, Va'amar Talehem, tell these Jews, which are complaining about their Gaulus. Adonoi Hashem Bachari Israel. That day when I had chosen the Jews. I raised my hand in salvation to the seed of the house of Jacob. I made myself known to them in the land of Egypt. Midrash and Midrash. We're talking about tens of years before the Exodus when God sent Aaron and prophesied redemption to the Jews. I raised my hand to them more and I said, It is I. Who is Yudke Vavke, as we learned in the previous year, Hovet Kadmon, the absolute primary existent, Ashrimenu, Hakol, everything comes from him, Bechephus of Yecholus, and his omnipotence and his will, and I am your Lord. I reintroduced myself to them. I told them, hello, this is me. Who at that day, when I introduced myself to them, Nasasi I raised my hand to them. Equals, I was open and ready to, to show my power and take them out. I wanted to take them. I showed them, I am here to take you out of this land of Egypt and bring you to the land which I had chosen and I spied out or found out, checked out for you. Zavat is an unbelievable place flowing with, with, with plenty, milk and honey, which are obviously at the time, uh, uh, dealing with the commodities which made this a very, very fruitful land. It is high and above beyond all other lands. I'm giving you this beautiful place. But I have one condition, God said. I told them, those abominations which are in your eyes, please get rid of them. Can you stop polluting yourselves with the abominations of the Egyptians equals the Avedi Zora, equals the constellation Aries, which they um, worshipped, or whether it be the sun god Ra. Ani, it is only I, Hashem, again, the omnipotent God, creator, Elokechem, which is your Lord. That's what God said. I introduced myself to you. I promised you freedom. I promised you bringing you to the most beautiful place in the area. 
But one thing, you've got to walk away from your paganism. And Pasik Chesler says, Vayam Rubi, and they rebelled in me. Velo Avu Lishmoelai did not even want to hear me at all. Each, and she could say in name, Lo Yishlichu, none of those people threw away those abominations which their eyes were looking for. Bet Gulei Mitzrayim Lo Azvu, and they never left the abominations that we deserve the Egyptians. And God was angry. And this is years before the Exodus. But Omar and I said, I will pour my wrath upon them. I will diminish, I will destroy them with my anger. While they are in the land of Egypt. And those God already wanted to destroy them at that point of time. He had offered redemption. Conditioned with walking away from paganism and embracing monotheism. And they told him, take a walk. And God was very angry and wanted to destroy them. But asked the man Shmi, but I did for my name. I did not want to profane my name in front of the nations. Asherheim of Etocham, which these Israelites or Jacobian family reside within them. Those that I had revealed myself to the Jews in front of those uh, uh, Ethans. And I had promised that I would take them out of Egypt. And I did not, therefore, if I can't destroy them, because that would be a Chil Hashem. He goes on, you know, you can read this period. He goes on saying, for example, that even if you look carefully in the Mikra, even after Matan Torah. Well, it's a Matan Torah. After Kriyas Yamsu. Pastor says, Vayasa Hashem. I mean, it's, all this is in the Perik. I will just quote it freely, but really think you should read the Perik. The Jews saw the Egyptians dead in the Red Sea, and they figured their taskmasters are all dead, and now they will be free. They wanted to go back. They did not want to go to Sinai. Vayasa Moshe, Moshe had to coerce them to move forward. They did not want monotheism. It wasn't 40 days after after, after Matan Taira that they worshipped this golden calf. That was their natural reality. The um, One more thing, God says, you must keep Shabbos. Because Shabbos is the ice of your monotheism. No, they didn't keep Shabbos. Why do you think they went looking, searching for the manna? Because they did not want to keep Shabbos, but this was a ice dris of monotheism that they did not want to embrace. It's been flourish in the Pusik here. That's why. And you think the Miraglim was only because of bad things about Eretz Yisrael? No, you must read this paragraph inside and you'll see. No. God wanted to destroy them because they did not want to. They were afraid of going to Eretz Yisrael once again. They wanted to leave monotheism, did not want to keep Shabbos. Things that we don't find in the Chumash are explicit in this period. You really must see it. They did not follow his laws. They did not want to embrace it. There was a major tension for two years in the desert. The constantly wanted to revert back to their paganism and not to keep Shabbos because Shabbos was for them a sign of monotheism. And God kept on pushing and plugging. Now, you realize that after two years, you read the Bible, there's pure quiet. The Bible describes the, the, the trials and tribulations of the first two years. And then finally, there's 38 years of silence. I guess it worked. I guess it worked. It worked for that period of time. But then what happens when they, when they met the Bnei Smayev? The new generation, what happened then? Well, you know what happened. Baal Po'or was not just, was, 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 was once again embracing Avodah Zorah. Raman writes when he describes the uh, idea of Haboyal Aramis, he says, Ki'ilu mishatein im Avodah Zorah. You're marrying Avodah Zorah. And then read Sefer to Shaftim. And read Sefer Malachim. The try the problem of monotheism versus paganism went through centuries. 
you know, God tried his best. And at the end, he succeeded. It is unbelievable to think how at the end of the day, in the Western world, the world we, the Jews have encountered, monotheism has won in different forms, whether it's Christianity, whether it's Islam. It has, history is the judge that God's experiment with the Jews has worked. It's true, but it took a long time. It's a very slow process. It's not that simple. You can take the, um, the Jew out of Egypt, but it was much harder to take Egypt out of the Jew. They were pagans. To the extent that, um, so when we talk about the Makkah of Mitzrayim, understand what we're talking about. We're talking about God reintroducing himself to the Jews and ultimately to the world. They had forgotten Yud Kevavke. They didn't even know his name. When it was reintroduced, they accepted there was a creator, but they did not want to serve him. This was the reality of the Jews. Do you understand the morale writes, quoting the Midrash, that to take the Jews out of Egypt was literally like extricating, like taking a fetus out of the womb of a cow. A fetus is part of the mother. We were Egyptians. Culturally, religiously, everything. To take us out, was very hard for the Jews. I'd like you to, if you don't mind, go to the last page of the sources here. It's a quote of a book called Sefer Hazmanim. Sefer Hazmanim is a book authored by Rabbi Yaakov Liner. By Rabbi Yaakov Liner, the Rebbe of Ishbitz, Radzin. It's a very prominent book, very profound book. It's very deep, Hasidus. And there's many beautiful insights. I'd like to read <coughs> just a few lines here, how he describes the um, situation of the Jews in Egypt. Here it goes. Matzah zushanu ochlim al shumma, al shum shal yispik v'tzeket sh'avotinu l'achmitz ad she nignah alim melech malchem l'achim al-kadosh b'ruchu g'alam. That's a pasuk we know. U parshat rei neemar hatam ki bichipazon yatzatem eret mitzrayim. And we all wonder what is this idea of chipazon. And I always think of why, why, why did why couldn't God like wait for us to finally finish baking things? It's a muzay modme. And then I asked myself another question. For goodness sakes, how is it possible? Try a class trip to get one class together within um, 10 minutes on the bus. It's not going to happen. You're talking about who knows how many people with children and wives. And they're all within 18 minutes have moved out? I mean, that's a bigger nest than Kriyas Yamsuf. How exactly did all these Jews move out at once in less than 18 minutes? Why wasn't it Mahmoud's? How is it possible? This is the this Chippazon is miraculous. All of a sudden they walk like soldiers, a ragtag group of slaves of children and women. What are we talking about? I think this was an army. They were a bunch of bickering slaves. How did they do it? And why? Well, let's see what it says. Hainu sha'az natan Hashem itbarach li Yisrael koach zeh la'afrid atzmam michemdat olam azeh v'pam echad. God gave them the capability of totally disengaging from anything they felt they identified with beforehand. They had lost any sense of existence in Egypt. Everything just left. Can you imagine, in one split second, my whole world, my whole cultural reality, dissolved? Now, here it goes, something he described the situation of the Jews in Egypt. I want you to hear this carefully. I don't know any other um, book which describes it this way. I always had this intuitively. 
But he's um, very direct, and since he's a nice, profound Orthodox rabbi, I'm going to quote him. Okay? And he says as follows. It was a beautiful place. There were beautiful things there. It was a beautiful country. Why would anybody? This is my country. It's beautiful. Unquestionably, there were Jews which are close and even love, had great relationships of friends, of fraternal relationships with many Egyptians. They were their friends. This was a very insightful thought, which I never thought of before him. You really think that everyone was doing nothing more than laying bricks? Don't you know that in every bureaucracy you need clerks, you need off the department heads, you need so many different things? Don't we know that there were the Nassim, which were basically had diamonds and jewels, and they were the, uh, so to speak, the, the princes of the Jews, which were not laying bricks? Well, there were probably a whole bureaucracy. And therefore, there were a lot of Yidin that were machers. I hate to say it, I don't want to say it. there's a word used for those people that were machers in the camps. But it's the same thing. There were people which were being enriched on the back, on the back of their brother, which were being whipped and you and Ricky and laying bricks. Unbelievable to write this. Ksasmi Yisrael Shum Kravut, he says, Akama and Hashim Yisrael, Shalem Kol Tuv, Bayelem Srarot. A frightening thing, I don't think many people thought of this. He continues and says, And with those that felt, well, man, we can't go yet. There's still what to do. I can't leave this. And there are many people who this is terrible. What are we doing to the Egyptians? They're our brothers. They're our friends. Why should we be happy when they are afflicted and destroyed? How can we leave? Emotionally, the Jews, far and large, as an assimilated group of people, had a hard, had very hard time leaving the country. That was the mindset of the Jew in the Exodus. That's what we have to think about. How do you get them to leave? Even with the condition of monotheism and Shabbos, and it's about to take him to Matan Torah, God Almighty, I'm an Egyptian. You know, um, there was a period in America after the Civil War, there was a whole group of people that wanted to solve the issue with the Afro Americans to um, help them go back to Africa. That's how Liberia was founded, by the way. You know what? They failed. Those African Americans, they were not called that then. Then they were called the Negroes. Um, did not want to go back to Africa. We are not Africans, we're Americans. We may be at the bottom of the social ladder, but we're Americans. We're actually Christians. They didn't want to go back. Look at the Jews and think the same thing. Think the same thing. Think what happened in Egypt. It's funny. How could he take them out? If he, all he had to do was relax their, 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 their affliction, and they would have been happy to stay. They didn't want the whole bond, the whole package. But God says, I take you out with the whole package. And they didn't want to go out. This is a great author. But how did God take them out? When there was a total illumination, a realization of an ultimate truth. One has to understand, when we talk about Nigla, Kadosh Baruch what does this mean? It means they suddenly had an illumination, an awareness of an ultimate truth, that they are nothing more, that nothing more is nothing more than an expression of his will. He's the Hove Kadmon. Shemimeno Akol. 
as the Lashon of the Ramban, when he explains Anochi Hashem Elokecha, Elokeinu Roi Elias Lanu Laodain, we suddenly realize there is nothing. It's all Hevel. It's all mist. It's all meaningless. There's only one thing to go for, and that's the truth. And they realize that truth in the deepest way, in the profoundest sense of prophecy, which is miraculous. These people were not worthy of prophecy. They were pagans. And yet they all prophesied and had what we call Gilu Shechina. So they simply left without thinking twice. A Yudim Bibirur, they knew clearly, that what they wanted, but they realized that's the will of God and that's the truth. They simply walked away from all the preconceived notions. It's as if they hated them. They followed him like a fly follows the light. They followed him like the children followed the Pied Piper of Hamlin. They followed him glassy-eyed without thinking. And that's how God took us out of Egypt. And that's how, that's how we all walked out within 18 minutes. That's why no one said, Yankala, what's with your sandwich and what's with your scarf? And that's why we didn't wait for anything to bake. We just went. He puzzled me to say we walked without thinking. We eloped, but we were actually injected with an enormous sense of awareness, which was totally artificial. The Ari writes in the Leshem, I'm going to say this orally because I don't think that there's time to read this inside, but I do suggest you read that Leshem, which is there. Leshem describes how at that point of time, God annulled the Matthias of Yetzir Ra. There was nothing else but man and God. It's as if the serpent in Eden was destroyed. And at that point of time, only for that day. Afterwards, God had to create a counterbalance to this enormous intervention in man's life by creating a reality which is frightening to think about that by Shvi Shapesach he created a reality where you can see clear visions of God and yet deny it and yet not care about it and live not thinking about it. Leshem writes in the name of the Ari that the Yom Huledes of Kfira in front of the biggest Gili Nisim is Shvi Shapesach. Shvi Shapesach is the Yom Huledes of heresy that you can see Nisim Gluyim and you can literally deny the existence of God. Frightening, but it's worth seeing. You should read that Russia. I'm not going to do it now. It's very late. But that's what happened. God literally injected us with a mind-expanding experience of understanding. We attained Om, enlightenment, and we just followed it. And then the jingle jangle morning that came after, we said, where are we? And we started bickering again. But you know, I guess it's like jump-starting a battery, you know, a car. But sometimes you do artificial intervention. And you keep it running and running, and then finally the battery uh, powers on its own. It took God two years to do it. From Yitzhak Mitzrayim until the two years of quiet, after two years in the desert. But again, it worked. So you must understand that... Um, just for a minute. Basically, I have a low battery here. There we are. You must understand that um, we had re reintroduced to religion. We didn't know God. And the Ramban elaborates that this is the end of Pasha's body, but you must all know this also in the name of the Abarbanel that the Marcos were there to reintroduce God to our mind. You know the famous Tzach Adash Be'achav, Dan Sfarde Akinim, Or of Dever Chayshe, excuse me, Adash, Or of Dever Shechin, Bored Ar B'chayshe B'chayus. We know that on the staff of Moshe Rabbeinu, these abbreviations were written in that way. 
The Avarbano explains, if you look carefully, the Makos were divided into three categories. It would be great to spend a whole year just explaining how each Maka is in this big category some other time. The first category was Dam Tzvadei And there the Pasuk says, why does God do this? That you should know that I am God. As simple as that. The second group, Adash, Oroi, Dever, Shin, was the Manteda Ki Ani Hashem B'Kerev Oroz. I'm not the creator. I'm actually involved. I am involved. I care. And the last one was Bored Abu Chayshu B'Chayrus, the Mantedu Ki Ain Kemoini B'Chalorz. I am omnipotent. That I have no friends. I am alone. It is all up to me. There is no Neptune and no Zeus. They are nothing more than my tools, my chisel, my saw, my hammer, and my screwdriver. They are not noblemen. It is all me. Those are ideas. The Ramban elaborates on this, if you look carefully at the end of Parsha's boy, were major issues of theology, which we were default, we were defaulting, and we didn't know that. We didn't know you'd cave up as creator. We didn't, even if there was, we didn't think he would be involved in our lives and he cared. We didn't realize he, did, he wasn't a king with a court, but rather one God with tools. We didn't know these things. And because of that, we ran after our God threw the Marcus a year of trying to teach them this. That's what this was. It was me, try, God trying to teach the man, yes, I am the one creator. Read this. It's all a Pasuk in Chumash. Pasuk says in your first page in Source Hey. Yom HaShem and Moshe, Bo El Paro, come with me to Pharaoh, Ki Ani Ichbat Yesli Bo Vesle Bavadav, I have laid callous his heart, his feelings, and the feelings of his servants, Laman Shitiyo Tatai Ele Bekiboy, from in order for me to plant the signs of my existence within them. In order that you should tell your children and their grandchildren. That's what I finagled with the Egyptians. But Oto signed those signs of my existence, Ashusamti Bum, that I'd laid in the midst of them for what? Four words of the purpose of this whole thing. And you will know. Ki ani yud kevavke that I am ovekadmon ashirimenu hakol bechepetz viyachos. There you have it. So the mechut that the Rajbi says, with the greatest respect, take me out of Egypt and slavery. That was just the means towards an end. The real issue was the world was going to come to an end because there was not going to be any monotheism. God was going to say goodbye to creation. There was no reason for history to continue. The issue was not the Jews. The issue was the Seba Sabria. If there's a song we should be singing in the night of Pesach, it should be Dvojak's new world. The reason for creation stopped. The only reason for creation, if we have a nation which will live, breathe, walk, and talk, monotheism, and teach that to humanity, as Ramban elaborates on, Actually, it's in your source, since it's late, I'm not going to read it inside. It's in source your Dalit. Source your Dalit. Read the words to you. It's page five. Adam betachtonim, she akir et boro yodel lishmo. Man was created to recognize his creator and to admit to his existence. He empowered him with the capability of doing good and bad. Now they used their free will and they sinned with the frugal and they denied his existence. There's only this one nation, which is still set aside for his name. And he advertised literally through signs and miracles, signs and proofs to be exact. 
Ki hu eloke Elohim. He is the Lord of Lords. Vadonei Adonim, he is the master of all masters. And thus the nations will know this again. Behold, if the, if the memory of this nation, the Jews, will be destroyed and lost, then the nations will forget those signs of God's existence, Vet Masav and his actions. No one will talk about them anymore. It's very simple. The impact of Greek mythology on literature is nice. But no one, it's only mythology, it had no religious effect on society. Take away a nation which reads, walks, and talks the Bible and the story of Egypt and Sinai, that would go to mythology. We'd have a nice mythology book we would read to our children, something like Grimm's fairy tales or the stories of Zeus and Minerva. And that's what it had been. And the impact on society would have been minimum. It would not have brought the world back to embracing monotheism. No one would have talked about it anymore. If that would be the case, there wouldn't be Jews carrying the story, then the reason for existence would cease to be. There'll be no one anymore to know his creator. You know why we exist? For the same reason that God wanted the world to be, he wants a nation to facilitate that. And that's us. We exist only for that purpose. To embrace and to teach monotheism, the belief of one God, to humanity. It's worked. I'll be very honest with you. It's unbelievably worked. Whether it's through Christianity, through Islam, but paganism is definitely doesn't exist in the world that the Jew has come close to which is take away the Far East, take Africa is definitely monotheistic today, Asia, the Americas, Europe, the only places of pure paganism still lie in the Far East and India. It's unbelievable how this has worked. This is the idea. That's why God took us out of Egypt. Pasik says, we say this every time, we say, Bavur zeh asa Hashem li b'mitzrayim, Rashi says, Bavur Zeh, Bavur Shakeem Mitzvotav. That should fulfill his commandments. That should do, live the lifestyle that he wants me to live. As the Pusik says in Tvarim, in order to enhance the capability of constant God awareness. We discussed this in the previous year. Suggest you go back to Source Ches to see it there. Now you can understand why the major theme of the night is exactly that. The purpose of Egypt, we should stop thinking about us alone. We must think of Kavana Sabria. Kavana Sabria was endangered. And without this nest of Yitzhak Mitzrayim, God would have said, oops, and closed the door in history. Kavana Sabria was, took an, God gave the world another chance by doing this crazy thing of infusing us and forcing us into monotheism driving us nuts, actually, creating a covenant, etc., and finally re-jumped the motor which moved the world further on. You actually have to think of Night of Pesach, the great movement from paganism to monotheism, of the Jew and through that to the world. And that's the primary theme. That's the Mechot to the Rajbi. The questions dealing with religion, why are we religious and how the Exodus is the platform on which our whole awareness of God and, and covenant come from, is the story of the night of Pesach. That's the Michal to the Rajbi. It's clear as day. That's what this is all about. That's the primary story. Maschal Bignus, Umusayim Bishwach. Maschal Bavay de Zara, Umusayim Bishkevanu, Ledasa Emes, Bikevanu Li Yehuda. We have embraced oneness of God. How did we know this? What was the means for this? Now I'm going to tell you how we know this. That's through the story of Egypt. Then we talk about the nisim and the flaws and the great things that happened. What God did all for one purpose. To move the world further in Yichud Hashem. 
So the whole stories of Egypt are only a background, a platform through which we explain how we knew him again, what we knew, and ultimately how that led to the spread of monotheism and humanity. This is the Ramba, and that's the Mechil to the Rajbi. I hope that you guys like learn all the other sources here. I, I think I covered most of them in that lesson. It will give you a much richer pace of experience, but there you begin to understand why everything. That's why we didn't know him before. We simply didn't know him. We had other things happening for us. is the place we reintroduced to him. Have a good evening. And you're all invited to join the Ian Shurim starting um, tomorrow. Look up kby.org. Take care. Good evening. Thank you very much, Rav. Thank you very much, Thank you. Thank you.